Good evening, good evening, good evening, good evening. <laughs> you are on the Dominion Bible Study Series with yours truly, Pastor Hosea here at CBC of Hawthorne, California. So excited, excited, excited to get back into the Word of God. You know, the word of God, y'all, changed my life. It saved my life. <clears throat> it gave meaning to my life. It showed me value in life. It revolutionized my life. I love the word of God. <laughs> it is truly an incorruptible seed. I know the power that it possessed firsthand. I will never let go of God's word. Hallelujah. Well, let's get in it. It's that time and no sense of waiting around. Let me make sure. I got this thing up on my personal page. And we go dive into this. <clears throat> There's a storm out over the ocean, and it's moving this way. Said, if your soul's not. Anchored in Jesus, you will surely drift away. Oh, there's a storm out over the ocean, and it's moving this away. Said, if your soul's not anchored in Jesus, you will surely drift away. Oh, there's a storm out over the ocean, and it's moving this way. If your soul's not anchored in Jesus, you will surely drift away. Oh, there's a storm out over the ocean, and it's moving. This away said, if your soul's not anchored in Jesus, you will surely drift away, drift away, love, drift away, love. You will surely drift away if your soul's not anchored in Jesus. You will surely drift away. Say glory, glory, hallelujah. Since I laid my burden down, glory, glory, hallelujah. Since I laid my burden down, friends don't treat me. Like they used to since I laid my burden down. <coughs> Friends don't treat me. They used to since I laid my burden down. I feel better, so much better since I laid my burden down. I feel better, so much better since I laid my burden down. I'm going home to live with Jesus since I laid my burden down. I'm going home to Live with Jesus since I laid my, yes, I laid my, shoulder enough made my, shoulder laid my, glad I laid my, 
Glad I laid my, yes, I laid my, yes, I laid my, have you laid your, did you lay your, like I laid my burden down, oh, yeah, Woo! hallelujah. <laughs> oh, that thing got good to me, y'all. I'm sorry. I laid them down. I laid them down. And I feel better, so much better since I laid my burden down. I feel better. So much better since I laid my, since I laid my, glad I laid my burden down. Yeah. Woo! Hallelujah. Don't you feel better? After you done laid your burdens down, God didn't mean for us to carry all these burdens. He said, catch your cares on him because he carried for us. Lay him down. Father, bless us. Bless our time together tonight. Let it be effective and efficient. Let us learn of you. Let us draw closer to you. Give us divine wisdom and insight that we may walk in all you've already ordained for our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Praise be to God. Who we got? God bless you, my brother, Big Dice. Bless you, William, man. God bless you. Sister Lisa Red, praise God for you. Miss Karen Lewis, hallelujah. Sister Tammy Lee, Yolanda Johnson, Marilyn Williams, hallelujah. Deacon Vincent, Sister Tiffany Jefferson, hallelujah. Norman Williams, bless you. Misha Boo, God bless you. Tasha Marshall, God bless you. B. Tanner Love, Pastor Johnson, Preston Siggy, Les Rock Michelle, hallelujah. What a blessing it is to lay those burdens down. Give them to God. You know, after you pray, you should be lighter. Because in prayer, you should have took it all to God and left it there. All right. All right, let's get into tonight's subject as we continue our conversation <clears throat> from Genesis chapter 3 from last Sunday. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. And I want to add to that discussion on tonight, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning at verse number 33. I want to add that passage as we dig in a little deeper. As we dig in a little deeper than we did on Sunday. We want to dig in a little bit deeper. <clears throat> ah, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, God. There we go. All right. Genesis chapter 3, <clears throat> verses 1 through 8. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, <clears throat> which the Lord God had made. Excuse me. Let me drink a little water. Oh, 
Ah, that's better. Allow me to begin again <clears throat> at verse number one of Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, have God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden. God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. For God does know in the day you eat thereof, that your eyes should be open, and you will be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God, walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. They hid themselves from the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. All right, I'm going to go ahead and read First Corinthians 15 verses 33 and 34 until you're hearing as well. And it reads, be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Now I'm focusing on Genesis chapter 3. When the Bible says that Satan said unto the woman in verse 4, serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. For God knows in the day you eat thereof, your eyes will be open and you will be as God, knowing good and evil. Now we started this conversation last Sunday and titled it, You Can't Win Running Backwards. You cannot win this race running backward. Now, that seems obvious to us. Of course, who can win a race running backward? But we tend to attempt that every day in our daily lives. How? Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. <clears throat> when God in his word tells me I am something. But because I don't believe I am yet, I am exerting my energy in strenuous manual labor, trying to make myself have what God says I already possess. See, here is what Satan did to Eve. He said, in essence, don't you want to be like God? Don't you want to be wise like him? Don't you want to be like your father? You want to be like him, right? Well, go ahead. Eat from this tree, and you'll be just like him. And out of Eve's desire to be like God, she allowed herself to be deceived by the enemy. And in that deception, she engaged in activity that made her actually become unlike God. Because she was leaving where she was, victory, in order to try to get the victory. See, the revelation is simply this. She was already like God. 
God created her in his image after his likeness. They were like God already. Satan used ignorance to deceive them. See, what Eve wanted wasn't wrong. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be like God. To be a Christian means to be Christ-like. So that means we're all trying to be like Christ. So her desire wasn't wrong. It was her ignorance. And Satan manipulated that saying, ha, she wants to be like God, but she doesn't know she's already really like God. So I'm going to use the desire to be like God to draw her away from God because she doesn't know she's already like God. So here, you want to be like God? Come this way. Here, here is where God is. But if you don't know you're already with him, then you're leaving him, trying to find him. That's running backward. And you will never win running backward. Oh, boy, I'm trying to make this real plain to you. The biggest, what I believe, root problem that we deal with in our world today is identity crisis. Because when you don't know who you are, you try to be who you're not. And that wasn't fully established beyond a reasonable doubt in her understanding. So in order for her to eat a fruit trying to be like God, while disobeying what God said to do it, she made herself unlike God because she died spiritually, losing their spiritual connection to God. You say, why do you keep pointing out Eve? Why don't you point out Adam? I'll tell you why. The Bible says in Timothy that Eve was deceived. It says Adam was not deceived. At least Eve was tricked. Adam willfully, knowingly rebelled against God. He wasn't tricked. So I really hold him to the utmost responsible. But the reason I point out Eve, because most of us are deceived by the enemy. We're tricked. We're trying to get the life we believe God has, but we're breaking his rules to get it. And that's running backward. I, I believe God want me to be married. So I, I found somebody. Uh, uh, I'm just going to work with them. Uh, I'm going to get them saved. Uh, but the Bible says, be not unequally yoked with unbelievers. So you're already disobeying God to try to get what you think God got for you. That's running backwards. I want to make this plain today. I really want you to catch it. Oh, question. I like questions. Did Satan use her pride to influence Eve? Well, you know what? Actually, there's some truth to that. And I want to read you the scripture verbatim that reveals it. Let me, let me, let me get here. Let me. Go straight to it. Uh, it's in First John, I think it is. Uh, but I ain't got time to be looking all through this. All right, First John chapter two. I knew it. First John chapter two. I want to answer that question. I think that's an excellent question. First John. Chapter 2. Let me know right up to you. Here we go. Let's look at verse number 15. The question was, did Satan use her pride to influence Eve? Let's look. 1 John chapter 2. Verse 15. 
and 14 says, I mean, verse 15 and 16, it says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the father, but is of the world. Here God says, I want to make it easy for you. I don't want you loving the world or the things in the world. I don't want you running after the world. He says, I'm going to break down to you exactly what the world has to offer. Here is what the world has to offer. What the world has to offer is simply this. And he breaks down everything that the world has to offer. The lust of the flesh. The lust of the eyes. And the pride of life. Everything Satan will ever tempt you with in the world. Will be in those three categories. Anything you'll ever be tempted with will be in those three categories. He has to use the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It's That's always how he'll get you tripped up. If you want to know how to deal with temptation, how to prepare for it, there go the three ways right there. That's what he's coming at you with. Now let's prove it. Let's prove it. When he comes at Eve with this, her reaction, her answer is this. Well, the Bible says this. When she yields, it says, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, lust of the flesh, and pleasant to the eyes, lust of the eye, and desirous to make one wise like God, the pride of life. She took of the fruit and did eat and gave to her husband with her and he did eat. Now let's go to when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. After Jesus' temptation, Satan comes to, I mean, after Jesus fasts, Satan comes to him with temptation. And here's what Satan says. If you be the son of God, command these stones to be made bread, lust of the flesh. He says, look at all of these kingdoms. I'll give you all of these if you worship me. Look at them. Don't they look good? Lust of the eye. Then he takes them up on the pinnacle. He says, if you're the son of God, cast yourself down from here. Because isn't it written that he'll give his angels charge over you? Unless you dash your foot against the stone. Like, on, if you really the son of God, show off. Show them who you are. Show off. Jump down and let the angel save you. Pride of life. <laughs> so, yes, Satan used all three of those. He used pride of life against her. He used the lust of the flesh. And he used the lust of the eye. And that's how he comes at us. That's why the Bible says Jesus was tempted in our points like as we are yet without sin. Because someone might wonder, how could Jesus be tempted with cocaine if they hadn't put it together yet? How could be? How could Jesus be tempted to do meth if meth hadn't been created? How could Jesus be tempted to steal a car? if they didn't have cars yet. Because the Bible says he was tempted in all points, yet without sin. The Bible says he was tempted in all points. Not every little thing, not every specific thing in all points. There are only three points. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and pride of life. So yes, as it relates to what we're dealing with here, Deacon Covington, that her pride was included in that discourse. 
Now, listen, I see I have another question, but I don't want to take away from what I'm on. The question that Dick and Covington would ask me was in the context of what we're actually studying, because this question gets into uh, doctrine and denominations and things of that nature. What is the difference between a Christian and a Protestant? I can answer that, but I can't stop from this to answer that. So here is what I would do because it's not related to what we own. Vivian Bonner, if you stay on and you get back on with me next Bible study, I'll answer that at the beginning of class before I dive into this. But I don't want to completely leave the subject. So stick with us and we'll deal with it. Now watch this. Watch this. You can't win running backward. Satan has to deceive you into thinking you're losing so he can get you to leave your victory to try to find it. And you can't find it if you're leaving it. That's what he did with Adam and Eve here. Don't you want to be like God? Do this. No. You've got to have knowledge and understanding. God created us in his image and his likeness. I'm already like God. That's how I know you're trying to trick me, devil, because you're trying to make me believe I'm not who I am. So I leave who I am trying to become. Ooh. Okay, let me share. Let me let's, let's go a little deeper with this because this is, this is good stuff. Watch this. Watch this. In this race, Jesus started you from the finish line. He won the race and then handed you an out of baton. So we've got to run this race in our victory. See, the problem that makes it hard for many of us as believers, we've been taught to fight for the victory. We've been taught to fight for the victory. We, we got to get this victory. You better fight. You got to fight. You got to fight to get it. I hope you get it. You got to try to get it. Do everything you can to try to get it. No, no, no. no. And that's why we, we miss it so often. Because we have the right desire. We just got the wrong method. We have the wrong mentality. We have the wrong mindset. Because to fight, to fight in order to try to get it, I'm acknowledging that I don't believe I got it. See, as believers, to be victorious, we should never fight for the victory. We should fight from our place of victory. Ooh, that's a whole nother ball game right there. When you fight from your place of victory, that's a different type of fighting. See, that's the fight of faith. And the only fight we've ever been called to fight in the entire Bible is the fight of faith. So what is the fight of faith? I'm going to show you now how the fight of faith is not fighting for the victory. It's fighting from your place of victory. Let's prove it. What is faith? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So faith is knowing and believing and acting on the word of God. So once I'm exposed to what the word of God says, I believe it in my heart and I act out of that truth. That's fighting from your place of victory. Watch this. Here, let's say I'm fighting for healing. Oh, Lord, just please heal me, Jesus. Please, I know you're able. Lord, I know you got the power. Lord, please just heal me, Lord, if you don't mind. Lord, if it be not will, Lord, just please, Lord, just heal me. Just move this pain. Lord, please, Jesus. I'm at Lord, I show hope. Hey, pray with me. I need God to heal me. I hope you do it. I hope you do it. Lord, please heal him. Lord, heal him. Heal him, Lord. Please, please heal him. That's fighting for the victory. That's not the fight of faith. Why not? Because faith is based on what the word of God already promised. Faith, oh, let me make this plain. Stay with me because I told you I'm going deeper on this. Faith doesn't get God to do something. That's not how dominion works. Faith don't make God do nothing. 
that's not even what faith is. Faith is believing in your heart based on what God has informed us that he already did by grace. If God hadn't healed you by grace, you couldn't get healed with faith. If God hadn't saved us by grace, we couldn't get saved or receive salvation rather by faith. Faith allows me to appropriate or access or receive what God already did by grace. Grace is about God finished work. So now the fight of faith is finding out what God did. Oh, wait a minute. God already healed me. It said right here in Isaiah 53, 4 and 5 and 1 Peter 2 and 24 and Matthew 8, 16 and 17. By his stripes I was healed. By his stripes ye were healed. By his stripes I am healed. I'm healed. Wait a minute. Jesus already paid for my healing? Okay, well, the devil is alive. In the name of Jesus, I decree and declare by Jesus' stripes, I am healed. Father, I thank you for healing me in the name of Jesus. Sickness, I demand you to flee from my body in the name of Jesus. You have no right to remain here, for I am already healed and covered by the blood of Jesus, and that blood is against you, so you've got to go in the mighty name of Jesus. See, there's a difference in that prayer. And Lord, Lord, please, Lord, please, please heal me, Lord. Please, Lord, if you don't mind, please. That's what I mean about the difference between fighting for the victory versus fighting from your place of victory. <clears throat> Watch this quote. Watch this quote. I see you, Sister Yolanda. I'm going to come back to you. I just don't want to break this flow. I'm in a groove right now. Watch this quote uh, by Jim Fannin. I love this. The champion wins first, then walks into the arena. Everybody else walks into the arena, then tries to figure out what to do. Jim Fannin. A true champion wins first. He ain't even made it to the battlefield. He wins first, then enters into the arena. He enters into the arena with the victory. Everybody else just enter into the arena. Okay, let's try to win. <laughs> You're already defeated because you don't believe it. And I'll show you another example of that in the Bible. King David, before he was a king, when he was a little teenage shepherd boy, he defeated Goliath. Uh-uh, watch this part. Before he ever pulled out his slingshot. See, you're not hearing me. <laughs> They hadn't even started fighting. He told King Saul, let no man's heart fail him because of this giant. I will defeat this uncircumcised Philistine. Who does he think he is? How dare him defy the armies of the living God? I whoop his butt. I got this. Don't let nobody be afraid. Don't let nobody be discouraged. Your servant, little David, the shepherd boy, I'll take care of that jolly green giant. You hear this attitude? This don't sound like nobody who's trying to do something. He goes out there to fight him. Goliath looks at him and starts laughing and cursing him. He said, my dog, you come to me with rocks and sticks? He says, I'm going to kill you this day and feed your carcasses to the beast of the field. David was like, you through? Let me tell you how this really going to go down. I'm getting ready to knock you out. I'm going to take your head off, and I'm going to feed your body to the carcasses of the field. I'm going to feed your carcasses to the beast of the field. What, what about that? That's how this is about to go down. Now, come on. Let's get it. See? He literally had won here. 
he had established that God has already gained a victory. He said it. He said, for the Lord is finna show everybody here that he don't save by sword and shield. He's going to show everybody here today that the battle is the Lord's. The battle is the Lord's. And he's going to give you into our hands. And he's finna manifest it. Let's go. He's already won. Now he's just acting out the script. Ooh. The movie's already written. This is what it means to have a dominion mentality. Dominion is you operating out of who you already are. That's what dominion is. Look, look how God did. Adam, I've given you dominion over all of the birds of the air, the beast of the field, the fish of the sea, every creeping thing that creeping upon earth. You have dominion over it. Here, putting you in a garden. You have dominion over this garden. Now dress it and keep it and take care of it. Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, and have dominion over it. It's yours. He gives him dominion. Now, Adam don't get out there and uh, I show sure hope I can grow a harvest. I'm going to try. That is not a dominion mentality. That's how you stay broke. That's how you stay sick. That's how we stay defeated. It's the wrong mindset. Dominion mentality says, this is what God has already said is mine. Let me operate out of that revelation of what already is. Ooh. Have y'all seen this old movie that was one of my favorites growing up? Because I grew up on kung fu movies, man. I used to love kung fu movies. I'm talking about the good kung fu movies when the words don't match the mouth. Oh, that was the good one. I'm talking about. You see, I'll get you. Just wait. Those, those kung fu movies. Those, those were the movies. Hi. <laughs> those movies. <laughs> this is the point. I love kung fu movies growing up. I used to watch kung fu theater every Sunday after cartoons go off, and. And my mama raised me to know my heritage, you know, to, I read a lot of African-American biographies like Frederick Douglass, like, like, like Harriet Tubman, like Benjamin Banneker, George Washington Carver, like oh, so many, so many, so many, so many. I read all these biographies growing up to know my heritage and be proud of who I am and so on and so forth. And so they came out with a movie that was the best of both worlds for me. They came out with a kung fu movie with a black kung fu artist. Cause see, my favorite martial artist was Bruce Lee, but this movie had Bruce Leroy. <laughs> you are the last dragon. Anyway, the movie is the last dragon. Now here's the point I'm making. The movie begins with Bruce Leroy trying to complete the mastery of his training to where he would get this glow and it would show him as a supreme Kung Fu master. And his trainer had trained him as far as he could train him. And he told him, there's only one thing you lack. And to find this, you must find the master because only he can give you that. And the whole movie, he's looking for the master. He's looking for the master. He's looking for the master. But what he didn't know, he was running backward, trying to win. And by the end of the movie, there was this other Kung Fu artist, show enough. He would ask the question, who's the master? All of his posse would say, show enough. Who's the baddest mofolo from Harlem? Show enough. He and then sure enough, felt like the only one that questioned his self-proclaimed masterhood, if you would, was some thought that Bruce Leroy could beat him. And he wanted to fight Bruce Leroy. Bruce Leroy would never fight him. Because he's like, I'm too busy on trying to find the master so I can complete my training and master it. And by the end of the movie, Bruce Leroy hemmed him up and he was beating his butt. 
I mean, not Bruce Leroy. Show Nuff was beating Bruce Leroy's butt. And he was drowning him in this water. And he put his head in. And he would bring it out. And he would be all disoriented. Bruce Lee was all disoriented. And show sure enough would hold his head. Have to bring it out of the water, dripping with water, say, now who's the master? And when Bruce Leroy wouldn't give it to him and, you know, yield himself saying that show sure enough was the master, he would put his head back in there and drown in him. And by that third time, Bruce Leroy began, you know, the good, good movie when he get down to the turn, the, the fighter starts recalling all of the events through his life throughout that movie. And he started tracing back from his master to his searching to everything he'd been looking for. And finally, he got the revelation. So the last time Shonuff brought his head up out of the water, he wasn't disoriented anymore. He stood flat-footed and looked in Shonuff eyes. And Shonuff said, who's the master? And he looked at him and he said, I am. And commenced to whoop in his butt. <laughs> oh, it hurt my knee. <laughs> got a little too excited. I can't kick under the desk. So, and he began. But the point I'm making in this, he began to whoop show nuffs behind once he got the revelation and the consciousness to acknowledge, I already am what I've been trying to find. And when he awakened to that fact, to that truth, he began to operate or fight out of that revelation. He began to fight from his place of victory, knowing who he was, having an understanding of the dominion that he already possessed. And then he was unstoppable. Now this is, I'm using that as a parable to show you biblically how this works. We have that same ability as it relates to our dominion if we get the revelation of what God has already done. See, the problem in religion, we still waiting on God to do something. Instead of acknowledging that he's already did what he promised. Only thing left for him to do is come back and get us. Everything else is done. <laughs> Only thing God still needs to do to fulfill his promise is come back and get us. <laughs> Everything else is done. Watch this. Let me go to Corinthians. First Corinthians 15. Verses 33 and 34. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. That's what happened to Eve right there. <laughs> she was deceived because she allowed this evil communications, what she was listening to from the enemy, corrupt her good manners, and she began to behave in a disobedient factor to God. And so did Adam. And 34 says, don't miss this. Here's what I was getting to. Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. God said, awake to righteousness. He didn't say try to become righteous. He didn't say I need you to try to live right. So you can be righteous. He didn't say follow the rules and my commandments so you can be righteous. He said, no, the problem is not what you're doing. It's what you're not comprehending. If you awake to your righteousness, then after he said awake to righteousness, then he said and sin not. If you ever awake to the righteousness God has already given us through Jesus Christ. I'll quit stumbling over sin so much. We'll be able to defeat sin when we acknowledge and wake up, become consciously aware of the fact Jesus already made me righteous. 
it's hard for me to live right because I'm focusing on trying to live right instead of focusing on the fight. Wait a minute, I'm righteous. Righteous folk don't do that. Righteous folk don't go places like that. Righteous folk don't say things like that. Righteous folk don't act like that. So I can stop doing that when I quit seeing myself as that. We've been running backward. We've been running this whole race wrong. You come out head first. Whatever you in, you got to come out head first. Get the mind of God. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Be not conformed, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You can get out of anything you in in life if you can get your mind out. The prodigal son was in a hog pen, but his mind came out and his life had to follow. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I need you to catch this. I need you to catch this. I'm running out of time. I'm running out of time. Watch this. Let me break this. Let me start concluding on this. Stories told of two men that went fishing. And they were in a boat. And one of the men couldn't swim. And the man that could swim, he knew the lake pretty good. And he knew that the man that couldn't swim that he was fishing with was already terrified. So he kind of rolled according to what he knew about how terrified the man was. And the man was trying to catch a fish and he was getting up and the guy was telling him, just relax. But the man was all overly excited and scared and he got to move around so much he rocked the boat and out of his fear, he fell out the boat. And as soon as he fell out the boat, he began to kick and scream, oh, save me, oh, please save me, please. The man said, no, just calm down, calm down. Please. No, I can't swim, I can't swim, I can't swim. The man said, calm down. If it, why won't you jump in and get me? He said, if you calm down, you can stand up. He said, oh. And the man stood up because he was only in five feet of water. He stood up. <laughs> he didn't need a hand. He needed a revelation. Oh, my God. God says, you waiting on me to come rescue you, but I've already put you in a position where you're already rescued. The man that was driving the boat, he never took him in deep water because he knew he couldn't swim. He kept him in shallow water the whole time they were in the lake. Oh. The songwriter said, why are you trying to figure it out? God had already worked it out. Oh, my God, I need you to catch this. All right, let me close on this point. Let me close on this point. Jesus has already given you the victory. Think about this. Adam and Eve were already like God. Satan had to convince them that they weren't to get them to disobey God, to try to become like God. God sent me here just to let you know tonight. Tell my people, I've already blessed them. I've already rescued them. I've already saved them. I've already delivered them. I've already healed them. I've already prospered them. Tell them to stop letting the enemy talk them out of their victory. You are so victorious 
The devil's job is to try to talk you out of it. Oh my God, boy, I'm teaching better than you listening right now. Don't let the devil talk you out of what Jesus already put you into. Ah. Catch the revelation. You ain't drowning. Just stand up. <laughs> and having done all to stand, stand therefore. All right, all right. Let me come back to this question. First John two sixteen is loving your home the lust of the eye? No, loving your home is the lust of the eye unless you love your home beyond your love for God. Just never give the gift more love than you give the giver. See, realize this about your home. If as a believer, everything you have belongs to God, you just a steward. So when you appreciate what God gave you, you become a good steward over it. You take care of it. You allow God's purpose to be done with it. You make sure it's not just serving your your any selfish agenda, but it's also serving God's purpose of why he gave it to you. See, the key is nothing coming before God because anything you put before God just became your God. So when you say it's loving your home, it depends. If I'm loving my home to where it has priority over God, then yeah, I've, I've entered into idolatry. That's what that is. That's idolatry. Lust of the eye could simply be, I liked what I had till I saw what you got. Now I don't appreciate mine no more. I just want yours. And I'll do anything to get it. See, that's an example of the lust of the eye. Amen. Amen. I'm not out of word, but I am out of time. At this particular time, I'm going to ask you to if there's, if you've never made that wonderful discovery of knowing Jesus in a very personal and intimate way, I want to give you an opportunity to accept him as Lord. Open up your heart and receive him. How so? I'm getting ready to pray a prayer. In this prayer, I'm going to acknowledge that without Jesus, I'm a sinner and I can't save myself. I'm going to let Jesus know I believe he died for my sins. I believe he rose from the dead and he's still alive. And I'm going to ask him to come in my heart and be my Lord and Savior. And I'm going to commit my life to him. If that's you and you want to enter into his kingdom, you want to operate in this dominion for his glory, then why don't you repeat this prayer for me? Say, dear Lord, please forgive me for all of my sins. Without you, Jesus, I am a sinner, and I cannot save myself. I believe you died for me, and I believe in my heart you rose from the dead, and you are still alive. Come into my heart. Make me a new person. Teach me your ways. Teach me your word. Make the rest of my life the best of my life. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise be to God. If you prayed that prayer and you gave your life to God, I want to hear from you. I want you to let us know so someone can help you on this journey. I'm putting our church email address in the chat box right now. And if that's you, let us know you made a commitment to serve God, to follow Christ, to accept him as Lord. And we want to help you on this journey. If you have any prayer requests, you can also submit them to the same email and we will be praying over you for whatever request you have.
If you want to get in on our newsletter that goes out now once a month, if you missed the last one, you've been missing it, man. It blessed a lot of people. I fill it with revelation, sermon, notes, inspiration. We let you know what's happening at Calvary, what's coming up, and it just keeps you updated and informed. So you can email us as well and let us know you want to be added to the newsletter and give us your first and last name, and we'll do that. And lastly, I have another, another announcement that I need to make uh, that can really, really help some people. And I want you to be able to take advantage of this. Let me find that I don't want to miss out any information because this is some very, very good information. So listen well, because maybe you don't need it, but you might know someone. So the Green Foundation, the Green Foundation is a nonprofit organization that we have a great working relationship with between, you know, us here at the church, Calvary and the Green Foundation. They sponsor certain things that we've done. They're actually sponsoring our health classes on every Monday that are being taught. Uh, they're just great, great support and partners with us here. And now they have some other resources that they want to help people. So here's the question. Do you need COVID-19 support services? What does that look like? You probably mean, what, what do you mean COVID-19 support services? Meaning maybe you're in need of food. That's been a problem dealing with this COVID, this, this pandemic. Maybe you're in need of some help with your utilities, right? I know you need help with utilities. You know, maybe you haven't been working, the bills are piling up. Maybe you need some rental assistance. You need some help with rent, praise God. Or maybe you're in need of some health insurance. Maybe you could use the gift cards. Your children have needs. Uh, or some health education, or just any of those things, among others. The Green Foundation wants to help support you. All I need you to do, email us at the email I provided. Let me put it on my personal page, too. CalvaryHawthorne at gmail.com. CalvaryHawthorne at gmail dot com if you would simply email us and let us know when you email us this is what green foundation need your first and last name a con a good contact phone number that you can be reached at and just you know briefly what you need help with and someone from green foundation will be contacting you to see how they can help you in those ways. So putting the information out there, that's the email address. If you're in need of that assistance, reach out, and we will make sure that the Green Foundation gets all of your information so that they can utilize their system to meet your needs to the best of their ability. Amen. Amen. Also, Pastor Johnson and I will be on this Saturday morning at 10 a.m., God say the same, with our interactive Bible study where we share notes, man. We're going to share what God's been teaching me with dominion. He's going to share what God's been showing him, and we're going to open up this Bible and just kind of have an interactive personal Bible study uh, together, and we'll, we'll be on these platforms so you can join in, ask questions, things of that nature to bless your heart. And lastly, my wife will be doing the domestic violence workshop again on this Saturday, amen, at 11 a.m. I'm putting it in the chat box now. You can go to that site right there, DV for domestic violence, DV dot eventbrite.com again that's dv dot eventbrite.com why does it keep changing it dv i don't want to do nothing else i know what i did dv dot eventbrite.com you can register tonight if you like 
And a lot of those proceeds are going to domestic violence organizations. I hear they had a great workshop this past Saturday. You do not want to miss it. Tomorrow, I will be posting session number one from the relationship seminar. And I'm going to post, I have four sessions that I did on last Friday and Saturday. I did two Friday, two Saturday. So I'm going to make Wednesday relationship Wednesday. And I'm going to post them every Wednesday of session one tomorrow, next week, session two, next week, session three, next week, session four. And if God says the same after that, I plan to maybe start doing relationship Wednesday where I deal with relationship stuff. <laughs> and continue the conversation going. So, all right. So that's that. Uh, well, those are all my announcements. I think so. First Sunday, we're having communion in the parking lot at 1 o'clock p.m. I think it worked good last time, Super Bowl. A lot of you came out maybe 4 o'clock was too late for y'all. So let's do it. 1 o'clock p.m. in the parking lot. Let's get it. And it's going to be a blessing. Drive-in communion is what it's called. Drive-in communion. Amen. What did I just do wrong? Did I mess up something? Okay. I got it back. So let's do shout-outs. Oh, and lastly, thank you. Thank you, Deep. Lastly, if you've been blessed by the word tonight and you want to sow, into this ministry in any way, shape, form, or fashion. We're going, we have three giving platforms online with two. We have three giving platforms. And the first one is Givelify, G-I-V-E-L-I-F-Y. You can download that app. And once you go into that in the search engine, look up Calvary Baptist Church of Hawthorne, California, and our personal giving page will pop up. You can give that way and get tax deductible receipts for your giving transaction. We're also on Cash App. If you go to Cash App, our Cash App name is dollar sign CBC Hawthorne. Dollar sign CBC Hawthorne. You can give that way as well. And lastly, you can mail in Check some money orders to Calvary Baptist Church, 4081 West El Segundo Boulevard in Hawthorne, California. In Hawthorne, California, 90250. All right, I'm putting all of those giving platforms also on my personal page. And that's our cash app. And the mailing address, Calvary Baptist Church, 4081 West El Segundo Boulevard, Hawthorne, California, 90. Two five zero. There we are. I've got all platforms out there. Stay posted on this. The last Saturday of this month, we'll be back with our mental health panel. We'll be dealing with self esteem. Join us 12 p.m. for that. And let's see who we've got on the line so we can shout them out. Bless you, Brother Dice, William Brown, Lisa Red, Karen Lewis, Tammy Lee. God bless you, Sister Yolanda Johnson. Marilyn Williams, Karen Lewis, Tammy Lee, praise God, Deacon Vincent. Let's see who we got. Uh, Deacon Vincent, Tammy Lee, Tiffany Jefferson, Norma Williams, Misha Boo, Norma Williams, Tasha Marshall, Vivian Bonner, please stay with me, Vivian Bonner, next week. Don't let me forget to before I start. Matter of fact, let me make a note of myself. I do not want to forget. So I'm going to put a personal note in my phone. I got you. I'm going to see your question, and I'll do it before I start the Bible study. Lisa Red, God bless you. Stephanie D., God bless you. Miss Annie, Miss Latoya Ransom, Latoya Jones, Norma Williams, praise God. 
Melissa Hunter, God bless you. Sister Laurie M. Monet, God bless you. Naja McDonald, God bless you. Tammy Lee, praise God. Tasha Marshall, Sister Glenda Fennell, thank you. One of our great sponsors from the Relationship Seminar, Swag. Sisters with Amazing Grace, if you ain't up on Swag, you better go to Facebook right now. S-W-A-G, Sisters with Amazing Grace, get up on their clothing line and their skin line now. They got it going on, I'm telling you. Karen White, God bless you. Hallelujah. Praise God, everybody. Lottie Dottie. I think I got everybody on that platform. Deacon Charles, bless you. And who do I have on my personnel? All right. This one keeps trying to leave me, but it can't get away. Bless you, Sister Hope. God bless you. Bless you, my man, Relaford. Bless you, Let's Rock Michelle. Show enough. Don't forget the bullet. <laughs> he catches bullets with his teeth. <laughs> God bless you all. I thank God for you. Amen. Bless you. Thank you. Let's see. All right. Until the next time, may God bless you. May God keep you. Love you much. See you in the morning at 8 a.m. for our morning daily Dominion devotionals. We out.